this week, Jesus repeats his words, I am the bread of life, and followed by instructions about what that means. People had come across the lake to Capernaum uh, following Jesus. They wanted to hear the word of of Jesus, but never expected to fill with the bread and fish. But Jesus also told them to expect something different from the bread and fish, to take the food that he offered, the food of eternal life. This week we hear their confusion and and response. Isn't that this kid, that kid from down the block, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph's son? Surely he can't literally mean mean exactly what he's saying, that he came from heaven. And yet he seems to mean exactly what he's saying. I am the bread of life. Eat my flesh and live, and I give my flesh to the world. When Jesus talked about the bread of life, the Jewish people were probably reminded of a certain event in their Exodus history. Eating was synonymous with living. When Moses led the people out of Egypt, um, he he took them from a place where slavery was a way of life but they had food and water. Israelites did not have freedom, but they did have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. After all the plagues were finished, the people were in the desert. But the freedom came something else, grumbling. Grumbling because they were tired, grumbling because they were thirsty, grumbling because they were hungry, grumbling because freedom has seemingly cost them their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they often grumbled in the desert. It would have been better to stay as slave in Egypt than to die here in the desert. Was it God's plan for his chosen people? Was God so short-sighted that he only envisioned a plan for escape without a plan for providing their daily food? They had witnessed miracle after miracle, plagues creating a way out and the sea opening a path for for them. But something, sometimes the, the simplest things bring out the grumbling. Of course, God had the plan. Nobody ended up dehydrating in the desert. Water came from the rocks. And then nobody starved because a manna fell from the sky. In fact, they got extra manna before the Sabbath, so nobody had to go out and gather on the holy day. I mean, if you ask me, that's a pretty careful planning. But that was not good enough. The grumbling started again, and the prayers of thanksgiving turned to finger-pointing and saying, we are tired of this food. Were they tired of miracles? Tired of God's intervention? Tired of freedom? What exactly were they complaining about? But What shocks me about God was that he didn't just answer the prayers of the righteous people, but even answer the prayers of the grumblers. He continued to provide water and and the manna flowing down from heaven every day and even added quails to their menu to all, not only the righteous, but to all people, including grumblers. And you would think that at some point, all these miracles added together would have meant something to the people. I know I'm guilty of the, the, of the same, the clothes overflowing in my closet and yet never content, and food overflowing at my table and yet I want more and better and different type of food. A, be- a beautiful roof over my head, but yet jealous over 
my neighbor's house. How often have I acknowledged that all of this is given to me, given to me by God because of God's love for me. The hand of God was all over the people. Freedom from slavery, sea opening up, and the water, manna, quail, clothes, they didn't wear out after 40 years. Why do we so quickly forget? Jesus does the same thing. And just before this, in the lectionary, we read about his miraculous feedings, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and taking bread and fish for a few and then turning it into the feast for thousands. He cooks fish on the shore for the disciples when they cannot catch a thing. He overflows their nets when their human skills let them down. If you stop there, you would have completely missed the point. However, and the God's deliverance of his people it wasn't about manna. And Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were not about the bread and fish. Something better is entering into our world. God's plan is more profound than we ever could ever ima have imagined. Scripture, uh, verse 37 through 39 of, the, uh, this, uh, of this passage, it says this, Everyone the Father gives me, every, everyone the Father gives me will, will come to me. I will never send away anyone who comes to me. I have not come down from heaven to do what I, have, what I want to. I have, come to I, come, I have come to do what the one who sent me wants me to do, the one who sent me doesn't want me to lose anyone he has given, to, given me. He wa wants me to raise, up, raise them up on the last day. Exactly. This is what the cross and tomb are all about. Jesus is the bread of life, not because of he merely feeds us and teaches us, but because he is a Savior who gets us out, a Savior who comes after us. Like those Exodus people, we are grumbling about food, grumbling about the trivial things. And yet he is trying to rescue us from sin and death and, and offered us a true life beyond this world because he is the giver of new life. And we are invited to commune with each other and with all Christians before and after us. We commune with God himself. And we are called to be the witness of this great news of eternal blessing and hope. And that is, this is that loving relationship with God that brings us eternal life and builds the same, this relationship with one another. But relationship with one another, that is the uh, sometimes hard thing. We have to work to understand each other. We have to, to forgive our misunderstandings. And we have to accommodate the different needs of the one with whom we are in relationship. In a way that Jesus models the perfect relationship. He loves us dearly to the point that he will do anything even to die for us. He tried over and over again and to teach us, and he is a patient and loving and with, our, with, with our mistakes and misunderstandings. And he keeps on teaching us even when we are slow to learn. And I doubt that many of us could meet that standard of relationship in our lives. In fact, our human relationships are often marked with a sadness as well as joy, with anger as well as love, pride as well as disappointment. I would expect that everyone here could, today could, could tell a story of struggle with relationships. Relationships can be a struggle. When we serve a people experiencing homelessness, especially those who struggle to survive each day, sometimes we get to wonder. Somewhere in those uh, uh, persons' lives, a relationship might have been broken. 
and perhaps their, their parents might have died early or were victims of an addict. And that perhaps a, a person's uh, sexual orientation caused their family to turn them out. And perhaps uh, they served in the military and their experience broke their soul in some deep and painful way. A job loss, an illness, uh, something happened. Relationship was broken. Tony Campolo Campolo, a sociologist, a pastor, author, public speaker, former spiritual advisor to President Bill Clinton when he was in the office, tells a true story from one of his many trips to speak at conferences. He was in another time zone and couldn't sleep, so he went out at 3 a.m. and he found a donut shop. In the donut shop was a group of prostitutes who had just finished a night of, night of work. He overheard a girl named Agnes saying that tomorrow was her 39th birthday and then hearing others uh, other make fun of her. And then she responded by saying that she didn't want a cake or party. And in fact, she, never, she had never really had those before. When they left, Tony, asked the shop owner if they came in every night at the same time. When he found out they did, he came up with a plan to decorate the donut shop. And the shop owner's wife even baked a cake. The next night at 3 a.m., Agnes and, uh, came in with her friends, and everyone jumped out and screamed, surprise! and began the happy birthday song. When they went to, uh, uh, went, to, went to cut the cake, she asked, Agnes asked if they could wait. She just wanted to take it home and look at it. When the night was over, Tony said a prayer for the girl. The donut shop owner finally, finally realized that, that Tony was a pastor and asked him what kind of church he pastored. Tony said, I pastor a church that throws a 3 a.m. birthday parties for prostitutes. <laughs> the owner responded, no way. If a church like that existed, I would go to that church. We don't know exactly what happened to Agnes afterwards, or the shop owner decided to go to church or not after this. But that was the moment for Agnes and many others experience God's living and the life-giving love that night. So what kind of church are we? The gospel is more food-related than we ever imagined. If Jesus is the bread of life, who needs to eat? If Jesus is bringing eternal life to the world, who needs to live. May the parties of God continue to invite, to feed, and to change, for Jesus is the giver of new life, even at the 3 a.m. birthday party for prostitutes. Amen.